Hello again, Dota fans, and welcome back to Shared Tango's Dota 2 podcast with Trent and Zayori. It's episode 15. We've been talking about ESL Los Angeles intermittently on the last few episodes, and today we're really going to take the deep dive. We've got a special guest, none other than Mr. Pop-Tart, David Majaya himself. 23 days of straight <laughs> observing <laughs> madness. He's alive, he survived, and he's here to tell us all about it. Dave, how you doing, man? Pretty good. It's um Mejia, by the way, but it's fine. It's fine. It's a soft J. I should have known. I'm sorry about like that. Like it's, it's an H because it's Spanish. Yeah. Well, that that makes perfect yeah. sense. Sorry about that. Oh, no, it's fine. It's so, like a pet peeve. I just like grown up my whole life with like my name. Okay. Wow. So it's just like. Eh. You heard it here. But I prefer I prefer Pop Tart. Pop Tart. Good old Pop Tart. Yeah, Pop Tart Deo. Me. He's uh he's also Japanese. I know he doesn't look like it, but. Uh, <laughs> I think it's his maternal grandmother, twice removed, something like mm. that. Correct, correct. Trent, how you doing, bud? What's going on in Halifax? Oh, you know, hanging out, casting some Dota, watching lots of Dota. I'm I'm starting to slide back into all the Dota content. So it's uh, it's stressful at first because like I haven't been super into Dota because I can't just watch Dota all day because I have both kids at home. So it's like scary because I don't want to make a lot of mistakes, but. You know, I put in the time, watched on the replays. I'm feeling pretty good at this point. Plus, there have been so many changes now that everyone's just confused. Uh, and I feel like that's really helping me out here. Yeah, the uh, couple of C games that we covered, it, it feels like Dota is in a very different spot right now. I think we're all still trying to digest the most recent changes to income and the lack of income from streak shutdowns compared to before. Uh, it's it's a rough time. Games feel like they just end right now. I was rewatching the ESL yeah. Europe finals the best of five og vp and the games aren't bad but a couple of them i'm like okay there's six minutes left in this video and there's a 2k net worth lead right now so <laughs> yeah. something about something's about to happen you know snape is about to do some shit that's going to make me jump up in my seat and it's like oh no they just lost a team fight and only had two buybacks and now their high ground's dead and then one of them died and the game's over oh yeah we kind of okay. had this this idea of just like covering a lot of the finals for this podcast. And well, I watched the finals and I don't know if you'll get a whole podcast out of it. I'll tell you <laughs> that much. Yeah. yeah, it was a quick one for sure. We um, got like one, one good game. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it was, uh, it was a nice viewing of the current patch. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I think that could maybe lead to a broader conversation about where we're going with Dota, what maybe we'd like to see tweaked or changed and, um, you know, if this is more just a byproduct of the current meta not being completely developed yet and we just need to figure out the antidote to the death ball strategy that we've been seeing more and more. Now, before we dive in, uh, I do want to take a moment and read a couple of these iTunes reviews. We, we sent out the oh, bat yes. signal or the Trent signal, as I like to call it. We, we asked for your help. And um, you guys back in the call, we've got a couple here, and we're going to make this a recurring theme, so please get out there on iTunes if you're listening, especially if you're listening on an iPhone right now. That rating on iTunes would make me so happy. I'm a fellow Apple user, and everyone makes fun of me for it, so you and I, we could connect. This is our time, podcast listeners. I know a quarter Finally. of you are listening on iTunes right now. Um, so here we go. A five-star review from Pure Real Truism. Trent is great. Really enjoy Trent. The other guy's voice changes inflection and tone pretty often. This wakes up my child. I looked up pictures of him as well to find out more. Weird. <laughs> Thank you, pure truism. I mean, what's great about that is I noticed the date on that review, and it's from March 10th, 2020. So that was before... Wow. We asked for reviews. That was a truly <laughs> organic. <laughs> that person went out of their way to let us know that they looked me up on the internet and found it to be weird. So shout out to you. Uh, DVO, DVO of 414 says, very good. This is the third best podcast coming out of Moonduck. Top tier. Top, top tier. You Thanks, wouldn't Divo. expect a novelist and a hockey player to know so much about esports, but they seem to know things good. Very nice. Buy Zayori's book, please. <laughs> I have to second. And he spelled esports E dash capital S and then apostrophe S at the end. So we don't know much about esports possessive. Um, still trying to decipher that one. <laughs> Evo's a, a known known fan of the show. 
<laughs> Thank you, Devo. Yes, indeed. And uh, one more for good uh, posterity here. Jandor says, Moonduck for life. Trent and Zayori have great chemistry. Good way to keep up with the drama, the pro scene, and patch changes while listening to good banter. I'm flattered. That's like so true. Sir, matter. It's so true. Oh, my <laughs> God. You guys have the bants. You're funny. You're clever. This is exactly what real truism is talking about. So uh, thank you, folks. Appreciate that. Of course, get at us on Spotify as well. We appreciate all of your audio downloads. But back to the show. Pop-Tart, how was it, man? Broad strokes. Um, it was a different experience. I haven't done like a, a land that long ever. My longest one before this. Not was many mode. people have. You're in a very <laughs> small category. I'm even, trying to think. Even like everyone kept telling me like this is like how you go back to like the old school dota before i got into it but like it was long online hours so it was cool i guess reliving what everyone else kind of did to inaugurate themselves into the scene yeah 23 days i've done a couple i did a, a few 30 day casting every single day grinds but never at the hours that you did i think that was what stood out to me the most is you guys had more than one like 16 hour day um, yeah there, there were some long days <laughs> That is that is insanity. Um, I've had to hop time zones. We've done some crazy shit at hubs, but those are usually like two weeks max. Even TI is a pretty long event, and 23 days <laughs> is longer than TIs, I think. Right, Trent? Uh, yeah, long, yeah, definitely. Like including travel time. Unless and all you're that like shit. the people who are like there, you know, unless you're like slacks or something, you get there early. Mm. Longer than most people spend at TI, that's for sure. That's, that's a humongous event. That's true. Solo Observer. So I feel like, has it been like a year and a bit since you started? Is that right? Uh, I think this is my second year. I did King's Cup 2 as my I know, first event. I remember you were at, like, I was at your first event. And I'm trying to remember when that was. But that was the old BTS office. Yeah, old BTS office. And then you, that's when they had the old BTS house, too. Yes, that's so we right. We did, I oh, can't shit. believe it's not Summit together. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was the first time I met Pop-Tart, I think. I can't believe yep. it's not Summit. That was the CIS tournament, and it was oh, a yeah, yeah, super yeah. small crew. It was like me, Grant, Dakota, and Kyle, I think. Or Kyle didn't yeah, want to get yeah. to the hipster restaurant or whatever. Or yeah. you guys didn't want to get for the hipster restaurant. I remember. That event was a lot of fun. That was. Uh, it's cool when there's no rotation in the broadcast talent. So all of you watch every game. You have the it's a different vibe compared to these massive like PGL events where every combo does like one or maybe two series a day and you're, you're sort of covering different aspects of the tournament because there's so many different schedules. Yeah, um, and you might not even see people for a day or two. Yeah, like, it wouldn't be unusual for me to go to PGL and like not see Toby for a whole day, and then two days in a row we might have like back to back series and like hang out in the green room. But yeah, I, I know what you mean. Like these uh, completely clumped like small talent groups like you get with the BTS events are really fun. Yeah, so I, I'm thinking back. I, I can picture, who's that producer? The guy with the glasses. I remember I was playing Pokemon on my Switch because some of the games were boring, and he took my Switch when I had to cast and was trading Pokemon for me and basically oh, playing Boy? Pokemon I was going to say, it sounds like Doughboy, behalf. but it could have been Jared. <laughs> it's one or the other. Skinny. <laughs> was he blonde? I can't remember. Glasses and, and skinny. Smash, right? I don't see color. <laughs> Um, wow. So yeah, it hasn't been that long. I guess maybe we should give a brief history of Pop Tart for those that don't know. Um, what was your original motivation to dive into observing? Because you're one of these crazies that I've always been jealous of. You either studied or have some firsthand experience in computer programming. You're a software guy, so you you have the means to make a lot of money at a real job, and you put that aside to live the esports dream. Merlini did the opposite, right? He lived the esports stream and went, yeah, fuck this. I'm going to go make money writing programs. And now he's a software developer. So I'm curious about your what, what was your spark? What was your catalyst to make that dive? Well, I used to live in Reno, and I would program casino slot machine games. And then my company merged with another European company. And slowly, my position was just eliminated just through the merger of two companies. So I moved back to California, answered a Twitter message from bts saying they need local observers and then four months later i heard back from them and that was the the summit event i did pretty much damn i just i just kind of like lucked into it randomly in between like well i don't know do i want to program or do i want to do esports and then every year i'm just like well i could do esports one more year i guess i really like the people and the environment and then 
every year it's just it's find myself harder to get away from it it's such a thrill and then meet all the people and you make long lasting friends yeah it's really a fun time yeah, yeah dota's got a great crew dude <laughs> it's it's pretty awesome going to dota events it's very tight knit uh, it's cool to have these relationships that in some ways kind of go on pause because you have your indo- your own lives and your own projects and your own brands and then you come back to LAN and it's like these relationships just pick up where they left off and there aren't there aren't a lot of things like that in life you know we can all we all can compartmentalize very well i think that's a key aspect of being a successful dota person just in general be it player personality whatever and so which event was your first one was it king's cup 2 that i was at uh yeah yeah, yeah okay cuz i i remember cup that two. they hired you because one of the punishments in the original king's cup was someone had to do the camera and it kept being uh, Jack, and he was so god awful terrible at <laughs> doing it <laughs> while he had one hand holding uh, like a soda can or, or like a pop from Jack in the Box or something, and trying to just obs with one hand, and it was just trash. So <laughs> that's why uh, why Pop Tart was brought in. Well, thank you, Jack. Thank you. Yeah, to, yeah, you owe your credit to him. That's such such a Jack power play. Oh, you think you're gonna punish me by making me do this job? Jokes on you, bud. <laughs> Watch how shittily I will do it. So King's Cup 2, that was October of 2018. So yeah, you're about a year and a half in. You're still fresh blood. And it's an exciting time for observers because I think we're going to have a a huge influx in demand for folks of your sort. Uh, With the regional leagues coming up, supposedly, for the 2020-2021 circuit. Um, That's pretty cool, dude. How are you feeling about the future right now? Are you one of few folks in Dota that feels like you've got some solid job security right now? I kind of did, and then COVID hit, and I'm not exactly sure where it all kind of levels out now. You know, fair, originally fair that point. was my plan, that I was like, oh, I could do another year of esports because there's the regional thing, and then that will give me solid opportunity to make money, and I don't have to go back to programming. Yeah. And now with COVID, it's like, well, I don't know what to do. Do I develop from home, or do I ride out the wave? Yeah. So I'm kind of just playing it by ear. There's one drawback that I've I've realized on both sides. Of, it's hard to do remote production for a lot of folks because production houses generally don't have a Dota 2 or whatever the specific game is. It's all pretty specialized. Observers aren't really that common, and it's partially a function of the gigs are so intermittent, right? There's very few, hey, I work 40 hours a week, um, esports observers out there. It's very contract heavy. Um, yeah. So it's almost like it would be ideal for you to work from home, but you sort of need to double as doing production. Like in Dota, we don't really have any means to hire you to be a remote observer for a production that I'm doing here. There's just no way to pipe you in in real time without setting up RTM fee, RTM, RTM. But without being feeds. as good as BTS. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just like remote's hard. Uh, yeah. and he, basically, he would have to send me a stream that I then restream. You know, that's how the yeah. technology still has to be there. It's rough. So I'm curious how it'll translate with the regional leagues. I guess we also have a lot of questions surrounding that, um, especially given COVID and the uncertainty of TI and how any delays there or rescheduling could affect the next season. It's all still a goddamn question mark, Trent. I mean, if you're an amateur caster trying to make your way, I think observing is a great way to start. I'll just say you get so much experience. Like, just watching the games, you're going to learn a hell of a lot. It's They're true. definitely in need. I mean, for me, in my time, it was stats. Stats was the simple way in, and I did it. And, haha, suck it. Made it. <laughs> so, I don't see, like, I don't see really a difference in observing right now with all these regional leagues. Like, you could definitely shoehorn your way into one of these regional leagues. You're, you want to be an observer in C? Guess what, guys? There aren't any. I think there's, like, one guy I've seen on Twitter who does it. That's, that's it. Like, wow. if you... <laughs> There's going to be a league there, more than likely, by someone. And it would be a good opportunity to start practicing now, man. Make a reel. Make an observing reel. Put your observing side-by-side next to Pop-Tarts and show why he's garbage. And get that job in Southeast Asia. (laughs) Just, like, have these big highlights. Be like, miss this kill? I didn't miss this kill. Don't show first blood. Don't show first blood. (laughs) you got to get out there and sell, dude. you got to get the name out. I mean, there's a reason that Mott did observing on the side while he was working a career as a full-time commentator because there was a big demand for it. And as a play-by-play caster, you have to do a lot of obs also. Like, uh, we're casting from home, all this remote shit. Guess who's observing? This guy. So 
you know, you take out the commentary, and even if you're not the best observer, it's still a skill set that's kind of in your repertoire. But I, I agree with what you said, Trent. I think watching the games as an observer is kind of like driving versus being a passenger in a car. You retain the directions a lot better. And when you're driving the broadcast as the observer, obviously you're listening to the commentators as well, and you're really listening because you're looking for their cues, you're looking to show things that they want to talk about. So you're absorbing the content in a way that's very different from just watching a stream that you're not a part of. Do you have your own uh, internal dialogue when you're listening a lot, Pop Tart? Are you ever just like, well, that doesn't sound right? Yeah, do you ever like question the <laughs> casters, or is your own brain just like kind of listening to them? You're not really thinking that way. I don't want to call out people, but yeah, like when I hear stuff that I just like, I know is wrong, is just like, oh, <laughs> that's not, and I like, I'll talk to myself when I'm like, obviously, just like, I don't know, it's just a bad habit, I guess I have. And I'll like, I'll yell, I slam my desk. Like when OG made that comeback, I was like, oh my God, and I was slamming. You just feel the hype and emotion when you're observing the game. It's almost like you're playing the game, except you're just like observing it by yourself. Damn, we fucked That's up. Good. That, I, you need two that was, kind of passion, though. We were missing like, the Pop Tart cam. It. We needed the Pop Tart reaction cam to these team fights. Oh, uh, ne I was next production. At Roche. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember at Midas Mode, too, there were a couple times like, do you ever wish that you had talk back so that you could say things to the casters if they're asking for stuff? Or so I remember a few times in Midas Mode where you're just like, what? When you didn't understand what Black was saying, he was asking <laughs> for stuff, and you're just like, I. <laughs> What what did he just say? <laughs> you know, I, I recently thought about this at ESL, that like the new style of casting would have the play-by-play -play do the observing and you would have two analysts talking together and that he would chime in right there because I do think it's important for like the... Because what you see as an OBS is completely different as what you see as like someone who's watching to cast spells or who's watching like the little yes. analyst and mm -hmm. analyst things. So yeah, I think as an observer, you see things that just other people miss because you're, you're trying to look at the whole picture versus like... Is, she, is he going to get his BKB off, for instance? And then you hype huh. up that moment. That makes yeah, sense. like when I'm, when I'm an analyst, like a lot of times I'll be watching the part of the fight that's the least interesting because mm -hmm. there's like this, you know, 10% chance that it's this guy because I know it's him who can stop everything. Like I know he has that one spell that can do it and the whole video has to be just kind of watching the middle. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's good that we have this separation. Like trying to do analysts without your own PC or... or uh, like, way to watch the game is actually impossible. You just become another play-by-play -play guy that tries to read the items as they go by. Yeah. Well, and it's also, I think, as an experienced analyst, you realize that whether it's a play-by-play -play or an observer, they have to catch the main part of the action. And occasionally that means you're not going to be able to see stuff on the periphery. You know, you're recognizing that there's always a sacrifice. You can't just be jumping the camera all over the place if it's a really spread out fight and you have to make executive calls. So as an analyst, you get in the habit of looking at the stuff that you know isn't on the program feed so that you can catch the little tidbits. I mean, that's the hallmark of an analyst really doing his job, Trent. Yeah, it's telling you shit you don't see. Yeah. That's that's the job in the nutshell. That's all right, now we got to talk about the elephant in the room here, Pop-Tart. I've seen tweets. I see it in the chat. What the fuck happened with Catan? Is that the, the <laughs> game you guys were fiending or what? Is that <laughs> we we had uh, about one game of Catan a day just from in between breaks and stuff between the way we rotated out that we would all be able to roll dice in between series and stuff. And <laughs> I, I I have never played Catan before sitting down and I got rolled by Blitz in them the first couple of days. But I ended up walking away with two wins at the end. Grant on our last day, had we had like a six person game and he went from one side of the other to the other side of the board. The dream coast to coast game. Wow. <laughs> All right. Impressive. Okay. Yeah, so that that was pretty much what we were doing. In between series, we just we played Catan, rolled dice. BSJ is a fiend at it, rolling dice all the time. Damn. Yeah, what what about the melee? Fun. No melee this summit or this event? Mm, we had it up, but no, nah, not really. No code just names? Catan. No, we oh, play yeah, Catan every day. Damn. Codenames code is also another staple. Dude, it's really been play. so long since I've played Catan. I feel like every time I suggest it, everyone goes, oh, I don't want to play that, dude. I've, As you would say, Pop-Tart, I've rolled enough dice in my day. Let's play a game that's a little more interesting. But it's a classic. I'm such a board game nerd, and uh, people always ask me about it. I, I never had an opportunity to play Catan. I've played like every board game so many times, but somehow that game never crossed my path. No one I knew had it. Hmm. I don't even know how to play. All I know is that you go after the resources. I vaguely understand it. 
that's a pretty good summation of it. I, I don't know how to get people interested in it. I have failed multiple times convincing, oh, let's just try it. You're going to like it. Trust me. And halfway through, they're like, this game's fucking boring. I don't care about your resources or my resources. I will say one thing that the world desperately needs is more 1v1 board games. And mm. there's a game called Rivals of Catan that is fantastic. And it's 1v1. And it's, it's very good. I play okay. it with my wife. It's hard. Does she Two thumbs way ass? up. I think there's um tabletop Steam games has Catan on it. Oh, the tabletop simulator thing? Yeah, there's a bunch of mods for that. I see. We'll play that. Um Excellent. Well, gang, there's a couple news pieces I want to address. Did you catch this is breaking. This happened a couple hours ago. Did you see the security hole in Team Fortress 2 and potentially Counter Strike Go? However, uh Valve did tweet that it looks like they've, you know, CS is okay. But uh, some source code got leaked for TF2 and some 2017, some old build of CSGO. And somehow or another, some hacker types uh, were able to find some security exploits. And straight up, TF2, I posted it in the Discord earlier. There was like a message that would pop up that says, you've been owned by X. Go cry about it on Reddit. Suck it. Like That's it? Straight up. Well, I mean, who knows what other data they were grabbing and looking at. But that's, you know... There was just a bulletin board message if you loaded into the game that basically said, yo, we hacked this shit. That's scary. The code was leaked no. in 2003 and 2018. Oh, okay. I thought it was recently leaked. But uh, yeah, dude, I, I looked at this afternoon and Valve was trending on Twitter. I couldn't believe it. I thought there was some sort of a game announcement. I thought it was going to be something exciting. But I guess you guys didn't it. even see the news, huh? I, I did just briefly hear about it, but I didn't really understand what was going on. Well, that's, that's too bad. You know, old TF2. They're, they're still chugging along. So here's Ex the conspiracy. You ready? Oh, excellent. So the timing is nothing short of suspect with all this talk about Riot and Vanguard and the potential vulnerability of this always-on Kernel oh, yeah. watch, uh -huh. watch guard type thing. Do you think this exploit was done just to prove that, like, hey, guys, shit that we think is pretty safe could still get hacked? And, uh, you know, imagine if this had kernel access 24-7 on your computer to play TF2. Oh, I thought you were going the other way, as in, like, uh, well, this is just because, you know, Valve doesn't have the kind of access Riot does, their attitude's not very good, so this was paid for by Riot. No, I, I thought that's the angle you were trying I to I think hit. it's the other way. I mean, I don't know who sparked it. I think it's an anti-riot thing. I think it's to show that you're never as safe as you think you are, and uh, we need to set some restrictions here. I think this was, a, this was a Valve fan. This was somebody trying to take down Riot. Here's something interesting. How about the fact that there are 13,000 people active on the TF2 subreddit and only 6,000 active, or okay, 7,000 active on Dota? Oh, Does that surprise you? That surprises me. That must literally just be people looking about this leak. <laughs> yeah. That would be I, my guess. I don't Probably. think that many people still play TF2, do they? I mean, I love TF2. I actually don't know. It's one of those weird culty games that probably still has a surprisingly large player base. Given I, I got to check some Steam charts here, boy. <laughs> you should, actually. I'm, I'm quite curious now. But I the, love TF2. That, that's my first love. According to Tostris, he says the Valve News Network were the ones who leaked it. I don't know what the Valve News Network is. but What does that even mean? I don't know. Dude, TF2 averages 68,000 players right now. It's, but, it's up yeah. in the last 30 days. See, Pretty there high. you go, dude. People are still playing, still collecting hats. Are, are people that scared of Overwatch? They're like, well, I don't like Valorant, and Overwatch is dead. I guess we're going to play TF2. Yeah. I mean, what, going back to what the else? old quarantine games they know. Oh, yeah, that's true. I guess that, that that's a good point. All these people that have been working for the past decade are like, oh, I'm, I'm stuck at home. What, what did I used to play? Oh, I have TF2 installed. Dude, they're going through all their old games. All right, what servers are still live? <laughs> is this still a 24-7 2-fort server? <laughs> I wonder if 1.6 is up in the Steam charts. I think everything's probably up except podcast numbers. <laughs> Um, but who knows? So have either of you gotten to play Valorant yet? I just got my key today. Whoa! Did you install it? Are you going to install it? 
Security no, I man. I'm go- I'm going to. I mean, oh. after they released that one statement, I was like, ah, okay. So they have a bug bounty out. They're actively looking for this stuff. It's not some forgotten project. This is what I oh. love about Pop Tart. He's he's a trusting soul. He wants to take stuff at face value. Riot gets blasted by every anti Riot platform you can imagine. They post a blog that basically says, guys, come on, we're Riot. You can trust us. We don't have that much access, but we've got enough access. We're not going to go into detail, but guys, don't worry. And if you find something wrong with it, $100,000 with your name on it. So you let us know if you can break our security. Thumbs up. Awesome. We're not going to mention Tencent. We love you. It was a good faith gesture, I feel, from them that they didn't need to do. And I feel like it made me feel at ease, at least. I mean, they had to do something. They, I, I think there was enough dialogue that just trying to sweep it under the rug was not going to be a winning winning formula. Um, I mean, I kind of agree with you. When, when I saw the blog post, I, as much as I wanted to rip into you, I, I had that feeling of like, well, at least they understand what's on the line here. And I think now that you've posted this, if you get caught abusing this shit intentionally, it's it's a brand ruiner. Tencent sure. is public. You know, I think there are a lot of market incentives for it not to be intentionally abused. Now... The vulnerability slash incompetence aspect of like, you know, <laughs> what happens if somebody does break into this shit? Yeah, it's pretty scary. But the thing that I keep going back to is that they're going to install this anti-cheat thing for League of Legends players also within the next year or something like that. So this shit's going to be prolific on hundreds of millions of computers. Do they? I don't even know if they have hackers. I don't know anything about League. I guess I never thought about it. I mean, probably. I'm sure someone's tried to make like a map hack or something. I hmm. assume so. Right? It's. I I don't think I'm just into FPSs right now. I don't I don't really feel like playing Valorant. All right. I don't I don't know. I'm not in the mood right now, Matt. You know, I could see myself going on like a five man, kind of like how Overwatch was really fun when you played as a party. Yep. That's how I'm taking it too. Yeah, I I could I could live with that, I suppose. But no, I don't currently have it installed either. I don't even know if I have a key. You. <laughs> Then you probably don't. You would have gotten an email about it, I think. We didn't uh, We didn't get any from our hookup yet? No, our hookup didn't hook us up. I just got it from Twitch. Our hookup fell through. Oh, no. no. I mean, I see people with like four viewers that have drops enabled, so I'm sure you can just go get one. If, you, if you're if you out there and still looking for one, well, like, there's like, some guy who has 78 viewers, a former PUBG pro who's Korean, that has drops enabled. They changed so. it so that everybody has drops enabled now. If you, ha- it's, uh, if you have a key, you can spawn key drops from your stream if you're streaming valorant and it's linked yeah but some people account. disable it right yeah yeah you have to have it enabled it has it to be yeah, enabled by default though it does automatically turn on you yeah, i didn't do anything and and mine was on it's it's right. a nice gesture i don't think it actually increases your chances but now you don't have to watch the five mega streamers to have a have a dice roll you can watch people like me like you yeah i mean the the beta must be being pretty huge now I guess like, so. Must be I, I actually have no people. idea. I, I don't know how many keys they're giving away per day. I don't know how the math stacks up. Oh, well, Are they well. still like at a million viewers? Uh, I think that it's was... dropped off. Some. I believe viewership's dropping, but the uh, subscription is rising. According to Do Not Peak, I ah. was following their Twitter. Cool. I see. People, so I guess you can like subscribe to a games flow on like Twitch now. I think I have done that, but I didn't know that's what it was called. Uh, like you know, you're notified of Dota channels and of Smash channels if that's what you want. Yeah, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I've heard folks Ugh. asking recently about the watchability of it. It's, it's always hard to judge if you don't play the game. Every game that you don't play is objectively hard to watch on a competitive level. But I I don't think it takes many hours to be able to watch Valorant somewhat competently. As the spells seem confusing, but a lot of them do the same thing and are just different colors. They're just different yeah, color exactly. smokes, so you can see whose cooldown was used. It's not you know, nearly as complex as you think it might be. So I, I think the watchability is is more, way more comparable to Counter-Strike. That's always been one of the hallmarks of Counter-Strike. You can sit down with your dad and say, look, he shot him in the head. That kills him in one shot. And your dad can kind of go, oh, wow, look at that headshot. And that's it. You can appreciate it on a basic level. Yeah, Valorant still has that. Whenever I turn yeah. it on, I've, I've been impressed by stuff when I, you know, I see the guy has a smoke grenade thing or like a teleport ability. And I'm like, oh, damn, that was a nice headshot. It's like, that's the beauty of it. That's why it can be a lot more successful than something like Overwatch because it yeah. takes 15 seconds to kill a guy. That's boring. 
It's all this stuff in combo with Overwatch being on YouTube, dude. I still just don't understand that that decision beyond short-term cash in the bank. It's a goddamn pyramid. I believe scheme. we call that the cash out. That the cash <laughs> the cash out in year two. Yeah, <laughs> like all good sound financial investments. Short-term market incentives. That's where we're at. All right, Pop Tart. So, what stood out to you most about this event? Um, all the regions were played, but most of them were pretty short in comparison to Europe. Was Europe by far the most hype region? Uh, I think so. I think the pace of the game, it was kind of more, I don't want to say entertaining to watch, but it was a different style of Dota, you can tell, from EU, CIS, to every other region. I feel like every other region had points when like, they would fall back to like, a Terrorblade farming, or yeah. they had like, some hard carry, and the carries that like, they were the hardest in, I want to say EU, CIS, were like a Medusa, and that's with a rapier, like they're coming at your door in like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Or like, I think maybe a sniper from like a Navi team or something. But besides that, they were, it was like constant fighting. It was like, how can I run from point A to point B, farm as little as I can, but kill that other person over there? It was, it was very entertaining to watch, at least. <laughs> yeah, the number of last hits was really standing out to me in some of those last games of the tournament. When the meta had like really solidified itself, like that, uh, I think it was game four, I want to say. Uh, it was one of the games where, or maybe it was game three. Yeah, it was game three, I think, where OG won. They crossed the river at uh, 19 minutes or something with a 2K gold lead, and they never left. I think Seb <laughs> died on OG, and he TP'd back to the Opos. So technically, he, you know, that's his only way of crossing the river. But other than that, you had a whole team stay there for 10 minutes until the game was just over. Like no. and it was just constant run at you and slight chains and pango alt and whatever other low cooldown stuff you have going for you, man. It was uh, indeed constant aggression. Whereas we were casting C, it wasn't ESL one, but it was a, another uh, BTS event for the BTS Pro series. Mm -hmm. Not not the same kind of Dota. Still shorter mm -hmm. games, but it was not this crazy like constant aggression. Yeah, I don't think. I, I think we saw moments of that, and it seemed like yes. we saw heroes get rewarded that kind of played that play style, even if the teams weren't playing it. We also cast a couple really rough games in C. Some just, hey, we're going to throw, then you're going to throw, and we're all just sort of running at each other. We saw some, some one-sided matches that were also hard to close out, which also stunned me. I think we saw like a 30K lead where they're like struggling to break high ground. It's like, just, just go hit them. Just go hit it. You're you're there already, guys. You did the hard work. Um, well, let's hone in on Europe a little bit. The big upset, and I did not see this series, so I want to pick your brain, Pop Tart. The Secret versus Viking GG elimination lower bracket uh, in the playoffs. Yes. Because Secret went 7-0 in Group B, and Virtus Pro went 7-0 in Group A. So obviously they were the top seeds moving into the playoffs. Uh, upper bracket, OG, 2-0, Secret, 1, super, super fast game. Looks like Secret played a failed Arc Warden, and then a pretty intense game two that went about 60 minutes. Lower bracket, Secret got 2-0'd by Viking in two 40-minute games. What the hell happened? Um, I think the to take apart the first game of Secret OG, I think that's when OG showed how strong Pugna was. They, they, yes. they destroyed Bristleback Coddle combo with Pugna. And then that caught Secret off guard, and then OG played that amazing OG game and took out Secret. So some good strategy came in. They were ready for game one of Secret. Pugna two then, uh, games in a row. That's interesting. Yeah, and then yeah. they get... Man, that, that Pugna, we saw that too. And then he just got nerfed as well, and I feel like Ice Fox is almost pushing him towards support, but he's trying to make it too broken. But the seven-second ulti, we've seen a couple teams use that where it's just... You know, you, you back off after one fight and you just hit your Ember or your Storm Spirit. You give him full mana and HP and you're just like, go, my son. Kill yeah. them. He's like, I the, will be back here. He's the definition of versatility where he can save people with Decrep. He can set up kills with Decrep by synergizing with other spells like everything that Gyro does, right? A lot of the things that Sand King does. He directly buffs them up and same with the ultimate. You can solo kill people if they don't have any way to interrupt you. And then seven seconds later, you can make a clutch save on somebody. It's ridiculous. I expect yeah. more Pugna in our future. I'm totally okay <laughs> with that. And then uh, for the for Viking GG though, they uh, I mean they they want a Spectre game, not necessarily a hero that uh, we envision as being like super busted right now. Now was this before the nerf to Necro? Um... I'm trying to remember. I feel like this game was before. No, this was only four days ago. I think the patch was before that. What what number are you thinking of? 
Uh, it was Jeez. the one that took down the strength on Necro because Spectres were buying it first item. <laughs> yeah, I think this was after that. Yeah, I think it was after that. I mean, Shad still did it. He still did the Necro one build on the Spectre, and they had the Queen of Pain on the Mars. I mean, Mars, Mars is like the hero of the patch right now for sure, I think. Uh, him right. and Ember, I guess. But Mars they both so are just like looking to start fights all over the map. And I feel like Viking GG in that series versus Secret in game one, it's just like they pick this Queen of Pain, which they love. And they, that's like a very aggressive hero. And then they have the Mars. And then they just make so much space that even though it's kind of like a rushdown meta, they were still able to make the Spectre work. Yeah, Boom. I think I think his name is Boom. His quad yeah, yeah, is the, insane. The like, queen player. They, yeah. they gave it to him two games in a row. And I think OG banned it versus them. Like first phase bans in all their series. Yeah, don't uh, don't watch the games from today if you're a fan of the Boom Queen of Pain. Oh, no. <laughs> no. No watching, please. <laughs> yeah, that guy's that guy like an amazing KD. The guy popped off. Yeah. Showed up. The Necro book, though, even though it got nerfed, it still lets you play very fast compared to a lot of alternatives on Spectre. And... Well, and it uniquely fits Spectre because of the way the ultimate works, right? Mm -hmm. It's like how Demon used to do um, Necro Puck first. And you would orb onto people, coil them, and drop Necros. And they're just stuck. And Spectre can haunt onto you and just drop Necros. Yep. Yeah. It lets you push lanes, too, if you want. That's uh that's the secret to this patch I hear. It's it's all about the lanes. I mean, isn't Dota always just about all about the lanes, but yeah. yeah. It's uh there's so much fighting right now that you need to be able to kill creep waves super fast. You just want to like nuke that shit down, get the fuck away from that lane and go fight people. And yeah. then because yeah. you killed the wave so fast, if they have to send the, someone to respond to it, that means that guy's going to be stuck down there for a while. If he can't kill the creep wave, take some time and you get a 5v4 like on the other side of the map. Yeah, one of the things that Dendi mentioned in the podcast I did with him a few days ago is that there are strategies that used to work really well around a specific timing that just go bust now. Uh, the example he used was Orchid on Queen of Pain can feel like that. It's like, all right, guys, we have this strategy where we're going to have a slow start. We're gonna, It's okay if we lose the lanes a little bit. I'm going to get this item. You're going to get the blink. This guy's going to get his ultimate. It's all going to come together at the same time, and at 15 minutes, we're going to smack him. And now that feels like if it's not a deso timing for Roche... Um, or some other death ball to take towers, it's it's pretty hard to do that. Like winning lanes yeah. is just so much safer compared to these strategies that used to rely on a little bit of recovery. Um, now the the crazy fifteen minute timings are they're just like death ball timings to me. Especially because kills just lost everything, right? Like yeah, I don't think nothing is better about killing someone, right? Streak gold went down, streak XP went down ten percent less. I mean, kills got hurt the worst compared to everything. So going for like these strictly kill-based items compared to something like, oh, Adesso, which comes when you get kills and secure objectives, like you said, probably going to go a little bit better. And they also, I saw, I think it was on Reddit a couple days ago, a comparison of how much the jungle has changed in terms of economic value. This is the shittiest the jungle has ever been. If you ever have that feeling where the enemy carries free farming in the lane and you're free farming in the jungle, unless you're like drow hitting the triangle or something, the jungle kind of sucks. It's really not that efficient. Farming lane creeps. That's what it's all about right now. Who can bully everyone else out of the lane so you can set up free farm for your cores? That is that is the Dota meta in a nutshell. Have you guys had any position for Enigmas in your games you've been doing? Uh, I like heard one. there was one that was really good lately. Now I can't remember who it was. And he was like, a Lyrical was telling me about it. But, I was like... Uh, I think it was Zayats when I've been playing it. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. And they were just like stacking camps like crazy with it and just like destroying the jungle and then getting a super early helm. Yeah, that's like the only jungle hero that I've like in the recent times I can think of that used the jungle to be good. So it the only reason bad. is because he can stack four camps at once with all the Eidolons. <laughs> I mean, that is a pretty busted mechanic. I'll give you that. You just, well, like, that and he can midnight pull the lane down. back too a little bit for your offlaner. You help him and then you go jungle. You just True. dodge their position for when they come looking for you. Yeah, you're like a jungler that also denies some passive farm, which feels yeah. pretty uniquely good. Man, you're right, though. The jungle does suck. It has, like, no redeeming factors. You'd rather just be, like, pushing, t like, towers. Even though, I guess at the same time, if kills are worth so much less, even if neutrals are worth less, maybe maybe there is some value. I, what I have seen in terms of the, the jungle has just been stacks. Like, I feel like yeah. people are just trying to make a bunch of stacks, and they have really fast creep clears because... Um, there's not a lot of mid heroes that can kill ancients now, and the ancients are like kind of out of the way. Mm -hmm. 
compared to like where you could just have a triple stack or something or like three camps like the way the no tail was doing with the shadow demon where he's just like mm -hmm. making this like triangle just completely full of creeps so this ta can just walk over and farm it all up there that's probably gonna be more effective than trying to like make this ancient stack this amazing place for your guy to go to yeah plus like if the enemy team takes the outpost the outpost is also especially on like that radiant side just right next to the ancients so like the Radiant Ancients kind of suck, because if you try and, like, stack those up and they own that outpost, they might just, like, fight you there and take your Ancients. Yeah, it's you, it's interesting. You saw, like, um, I think during the first part of ESL, no teams were picking the Dire, except for, like, Business Associates. And as you went on through the tournament, by the time EU CS ended, you had teams picking the Dire, so they could take the bottom Radiant Tier 1 and then control both Ancients to farm. Yeah. But, like, the meta's already changing a little bit from what map side you want just to control Ancients and to fight over that. I mean, it makes sense. They have a lot of benefits. I mean, yeah, they, yeah. As uh, Papaga Ogre is pointing out in chat, they gotta suck for gold now. But what's really cool is if you have a stack and you clear it right to the neutral item timing, you're like almost guaranteed to get all your neutral items. Not mm -hmm. all of them, but you're gonna get like a lot of them done really fast. And then you can smoke with your neutral items before they have neutral items, which is a pretty cool advantage to have, especially yeah. when those nice ones come out like around tier two, and it's not just like trusty shovel. As much as I love Jelly. shovel, for sure. If you fight someone with like three items and a neutral item before they have neutral items. You just win the fighting. Yeah. And you snowball your laning phase just from there. I mean, I, it's a better medium where now the real efficiency in the jungle is your support stacks and then the carries just clear it out once, then focus more on pushing out lanes. And I think that should incentivize slightly more active gameplay. Carries spending more time on the lane relative to hiding in the jungle. I mean, the, the war, some of the most boring Dota metas have been the like Faceless Void, Battle Fury versus Sven, both of them just farming in fog in the jungle, waiting to and get critical mass. And all these pointless mass. kills happen throughout the game that don't feel like they have any impact. Yeah, and your supports are just running around, burning all their money on wards, and then nothing happens with them anyway. I mean, I, I think we're, we are trying to incentivize a slightly more active style, generally speaking. But, but we need to find the sweet spot, though. I feel like we're yeah. a little too fast right now. Well, so what do you guys think about these epic teamfight heroes? I want to start with Death Prophet, specifically because Trent and I both had this feeling of loving the hero and hating the hero while casting C. Pop-Tart, wh where do you land on DP right now? Do you think she's busted, or is she too easy to play around? I think if you get a good DP game, it's a good DP game. But I think like it's not like p picking a position, like first slot in your first two picks, and then having it run as a five. I did not like seeing five DP run around. <laughs> like a one a, or a two or a three, I liked a lot. Yeah, when you guys started that league 23 days before, uh, there were a lot of support DPs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was happening. Like, I mean, like most of the games I tuned into, it was position four DP. And I was just yep. like, this seems terrible. They're like getting the silences off. and But, you know, there, there's some parts of making a flexible draft that are good. You don't want to be too flexible. All right, you're, you're not that stretchy. I, I think yeah. I saw a DP that go like zero four four, and I was like, I don't know if this is what the position four DP was supposed to do. But <laughs> I, I guess it's doing its job. I, it, if you can land a bunch of AOE silences, that's an amazing support skill. But not just the ultimate. Uh, you know, pop ult, everybody runs away, and then it's sort of this now what do we do sort of hero. Spirit Siphon to me is the same way. You stack up all these charges, you drop all of them in a team fight. If the other team has any kind of mobility or ensnare to stop the DP from chasing. It's not that hard to break spirit siphons. Every single one of those crazy turnaround fights or those pub games where DP gets an ultra kill, it's because they just stand there letting her heal with the spirit siphon. It's a fucking busted ass spell if you don't break the tether. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, I, what you, though. What you saw a lot of teams do is like DP hit six around the same time catapult comes mid, and you have like yeah. both supports that are like level two or three just run to mid lane and help you take a tower. So at that point, like you can't run away from. A spirit siphon ult and guy run at you for DP. It's just that's yeah. where I feel like the hero is really strong. And then you take that mid tower and you kind of just open Roche for yourself. The game's over. And like True. if she can do that, DP's super good. Her yeah. uh, her Roche taking abilities are a, a big asset, no doubt there. Um, and as Archie is pointing out, spirit vessel, a great item against the death prophet. Mm. She usually buys Yules, but still. Yeah, that'll be. Uh, we'll have to discuss the patch at the end of this, maybe, because this will be all be post ESL, I suppose. But uh, in terms of the uh, the grand final, right? Uh, OGVP. I don't know if you use right. Did you you went through and watched the games too, right? I did. Yep. What were your uh, your initial thoughts as a uh, you know kind of 
lame and train ride spectator as as I was as well as we <laughs> didn't actually watch it like live because we were casting C. Yeah, I definitely watched them on two X uh, on YouTube, but very much so that death ball. The pre- I would call them a precipice game. Very even, and then one team falls off the precipice and it just ends. That was the first four games in a nutshell. Yeah, game five <laughs> was a little bit more interesting. Uh, a 50-minute match. That was the one with the Enigma and uh, that Storm Spirit that really popped off. Uh, Oracle Dazzle definitely convinced me that what we were seeing in C wasn't just a fluke in terms of having two heroes that provide sustainability. And I wondered that- what you'd think about that because we had some Oracle Dazzle games that were like a little dicey in C, having like the double save support, but it, it worked out for VP. As yeah. uh, I thought Enigma was going to win that game. I, th- I thought with the BKB, OG had it. I kind of did too. Um, and I, I actually got spoiled by accident uh, going into game five. So I was watching it through that lens of, man, this looks pretty good for OG. When, when's, uh, when does the turn happen, <laughs> so to speak? That, that last game just reminds me of like, how good mid or no one is. Like, yes. kinda, like, you, like You felt like you were sleeping on him a little bit during this season. You kind of forgot about him. And then all of a sudden... Like that game just showcases. Oh yeah, he's still like top five in the world. We've yeah, seen a couple right. of storm games that are like that. that and hero... look, look who he's playing against. Too. He had a silencer, uh, an enigma, and a beastmaster. He had to worry about that game too. And he just had to like keep counting the spells, watch where he was vulnerable, and and wait till he had that perfect moment to jump in. And uh, he he definitely carried them in that last game. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, this uh, ILTW, the VP player. Do we know yeah. much about this this gentleman? Is this uh, some young blood? He was the guy that was on uh, OG for a little bit. Okay. When yeah. OG were trying to figure out what they were going to do last year. He's looked for... solid, though. I don't know hey. if he spent a lot of time. Is he still on Spirit right now? I don't know. Is that a... It's been so complicated with the uh, the virus. I don't know who's actually a stand-in and who's actually I think he's permanent teams. VP, and I think Kuman's out, right? Is that is that correct? Liquipedia says Kuman's temporarily benched. I don't know... <laughs> For how long or whatever. But. Oh, that clears it up. <laughs> he's temporarily. But so, ILTW is like an official sign, right? Oh no, he's not. He's just a stand. Mm-hmm. No, okay. he's stand-in. he's listed as inactive on Spirit. So it my guess would be that he's probably still got a contract for Spirit, but yeah. he's on loan to VP right now, and they're probably waiting for some catalyst either with Kuman's contract or you know, maybe Kuman's gonna go somewhere else. And they're going to try to do this like uh, an organ swap procedure. All three trades happened at the same time. And they're still just looking out, you know. They still want uh, <laughs> some of those big ticket boys. They want themselves a dahawk or something. Yeah. They, they want they want to snag somebody. Man. On a personal note, that upsets me. Koo Man was there for two all that for two months? Two months? Jesus Christ, boys. What's happening over here? I want to know the story. I, I want to know if that is Koo Man's doing. Does he not want to play on VP? Or did management bench him? Or is it something completely unrelated? Two months? Yeah, you fucked up Bates launch for two months on Virtus Pro? I digress. Virtus Pro is a pretty big team dog, you know. Maybe maybe it was worth it for him. Two Get his name months? out there. Two months? <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Wikipedia says Kumin was a stand-in for Epileptic Kid. So even while on the team, he was originally a stand-in. Yeah, I saw that too. That is weird. And, yeah. then, and then the stand-in was benched, and ILTW is now the stand-in. And then <laughs> VP were like, two rosters. Yeah. yeah, so I don't even I don't even know if they've officially announced who their fifth guy is. Yeah, it's weird. I don't know what'll happen there. I don't think well, either way, they won. They they yeah, took ESL one yeah. online and uh, it was their victories that well first off that uh, that other thing that happened at ESL one I guess we discussed the the gyro game uh, for Sumail the uh, the catalyst for some changes in the recent patch I saw with the heart and the uh, the life steal amplification that it was providing from Paladin Sword and Satanic no longer works shout out to Sumail for. Fixing gyro apparently. <laughs> Dude, that game was insane. That was the it was like triple rapier and heart satanic paladin sword. He was so unbelievably unkillable with the accent. Yeah. That was one of the most broken things I've seen in a long time. That was up there with like Morphling Shaker before that shit got nerfed. Yes. It's like you get all the stuff and the cooldown reduction. 
I feel, I feel like a little more balanced than Morph Shaker, though. You need okay, like yeah. 10,000 gold or something. <laughs> yeah. 10,000 gold well, to, to make this. Well, to be fair, they were 40k behind, which is pretty much what Morph Shaker used to do, too. <laughs> That's true. That's and true. this is yeah. one hero, not two. That's true. You guys, do you guys want to talk talk patch? I yes, talk patch. I think we should. Um, I'd love to. We probably love should reserve more time for it. But yeah, Pop it... no one saw more of this patch than you did, so you're like the perfect guy to have for these changes. Nice. Did they touch? Yeah, welcome, welcome to be an expert. It's very easy. You just claim to be one and don't don't read anything that people type to you. Oh, okay. Good. I'm learning the trades of the secret or secrets of the trades now. Okay. Uh, so first thing. XP bonus for kill streaks was reduced. So I was again making that face, trying to understand the math from thirty to a okay. hundred times level to. So a... when when you have a a three kill streak, it's thirty four fifty, and then it goes all the way up to a hundred. That's what that means. Okay. As like the more kill streaks go. Okay. And now it just starts at twenty instead of at uh, thirty. And, and goes caps to... out at ninety instead of right. hundred. Okay, that makes sense. That's how you read that. I see. Well deduced, Trent. Yeah, I got you. No, trust me, that one's throwing me for a loop. I was on mobile, and I, part of it was cut off, and I was so confused for the longest time trying to figure it out. And then I went on PC, and I understood. Uh, Ice Frog went back. Thank goodness. I much prefer flat movement speed on boots, mostly because I play slow supports like Triant and Crystal mm -hmm. Maiden, and this ever so slightly buffs those heroes. Excellent. So the effect uh, translated to all sets of boots, no more percentages, just straight flat. I would agree. Uh, a nice feel-good change. Force but of course, boots, even that out, we had to change the flat of the Yasha and the Manta to <laughs> percent base. Damn it. We were right there. So yeah, all of the Yasha components, uh, yeah, from a flat 20 or 30, now switch to 8% or 10% respectively. It feels like a lot of these changes that have happened in the past two patches are going to send us back into these uh, strength core metas again, right? Like, we're seeing all these DKs and Wraith Kings and stuff because, like, what are the main benefits to being an Agi hero right now? If you don't have that bonus move speed anymore, now it's basically coming down to your minus or like your armor. Uh, and there's a lot of really good minus armor items right now, but if you have strength heroes that get this bonus armor, like Dragon Knight, he's just kind of like a better Agi hero right now. <laughs> it kind of feels oh, like it. A better Agi hero that can push. It yeah, that's another thing most Agi heroes kind of suck at, except for like TB. So changes. They're also to... faster too. I feel like with most non-Agi heroes, you can fight with like just one item and then go. Whereas Agi heroes are always waiting for like the third item. I feel. Yeah, and they're literally slower now without the movement speed bonus yeah. <laughs> from agility. So it's like, yeah, they don't really right. have a whole lot going for them right now in the Agi camp. That's a really uh, good point. We took away all the benefits of being Agi. Uh, Spirit vessel. Change here provides a negative aura that reduces health regen, heals, and lifesteal by 20% in a 1,200 AoE. Soul release, debuff regen, reduce, reduction reduced from 60 to 35%. No longer requires wind race, wind lace, and does not provide a movement bonus. And the cost has gone up now 250 gold. So Spirit Vessel sort of feels kind of pipe-esque now. Very unusual. Uh... So it's slightly le less um, reduction because it's now 55% if they're in your aura and you're hitting them with the, the debuff, right? right. Uh, instead of being 60%. More of a team item, less of a single target item, but now it does shit without charges. Zero charge spirit vessel still gives you the aura, correct? Yeah, and it really messes yep. up like mech and Chen because before mm -hmm. you were just like screwing up the heal on one person. But now you're reducing all those AoE heals by 20%, which is pretty crazy. It feels like a must-have item right now. It, it's like a good counterplay, I feel, to like the meta. Whereas like before, there was like only only this item, but you'd only put on like one other person. Or I feel like yeah, if the other team's like grouping up. Burst somebody is, down. Yeah, so this I feel like it feels nice to play. You don't you don't just have like the counter to pipe and stuff before it was like you just had to have your own and now maybe you'll see like oh I'll have a spirit vessel plus another item maybe. Yeah, I feel like we might as well add in this item while we're here, and that's that would be the Eye of Scotty, which just suddenly got a reduces all regen, heals, and lifesteal by 35%. Yeah. So now guys, if you're an ember spirit and you get spirit vessel, which is like a normal item, but now you buy a Scotty and you slay a fist of the enemy team, you're gonna reduce even without using the active of a spirit vessel, you can reduce all of their regen by fifty-five percent. Well, the That's double healer cool. meta's dead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Damn. 
You're right. That is just a straight up slap to the kind of death ball that we're seeing. Well, we we hope. Well, it, it's it's cool that it just gives you counter plays. Like if you run yeah. into a game where like a death ball metal is good, then there's like a way to counter that now with Spirit Vessel and that a core can build Aya Scotty instead of like the core. Well, guys, building. I thought Silver Edge was already doing that for us. It's a Not shame anymore. that <laughs> nobody uh, was buying Silver Edge. None of the heroes that could even really use it were upgrading Shadow Blade to get to Silver Edge. So Silver Edge is an even deader. They didn't give it anything to replace it. No longer reduces regen. No longer reduces damage. It just breaks people. It, oh, it's, man, I got to read the change log on this item. And it this still item. costs the same. <laughs> Like, why are they doing this to my poor Silver Edge? I've been playing offlane DK. I've still been buying Silver Edge, and now I can't legitimize it unless I'm playing against a Spectre. This item has got is so confusing. It has had so many changes. Oh. Okay, Archie's right. So it still reduces heal, but just not regen. So that's a specific, very specific thing it removes. So, okay, I take... What? Re- what are you talking about? What? No longer reduces regen. No, it doesn't, so, it doesn't do anything. Are you sure? Yes, hundred percent. Oh, fuck you, Archie. All right, let's let's take a look here. It, it no longer reduces the enemy's heal, life seal, and health regeneration by fifty percent. Okay, yeah. So I had it right to begin with. Yeah, it it's a shitty item now. That's not what Purge said. Well, that's what my wiki says. Do I need to go into a lobby? Get in there and do it, bud. Get I mean, in the I, lobby. Purge Purge probably just read it as it says, which he would be correct. It says no longer reduces regen, but. You could argue that that could theoretically be taken as everything. Well, I guess it's it's a poorly written note. It, it, it's yes. hard to tell. Let's let's test it right now. We're gonna clip this and put it on Reddit, and we're gonna educate everyone. If Purge is right, we're gonna back him up. If he's wrong, we're throwing him under the bus. We I mean, win. Purge is right to the letter of what the patch note says, uh-huh. but in the general spirit of item changes, I'm just going to assume it's everything. Well, to be fair, it says in 7.25 it. Debuff now reduces regen and heals by 50%. And then in 2.6a, it says no longer reduces regen. At least in the patch before that, they explicitly said heals, and now they're explicitly not saying it. All right. But it might. Well, well, we'll get the conclusion to this story momentarily. Trent's making the uh, Bob the Builder face over there. <laughs> uh, buff to nullifier. Debuff no longer dispellable. Uh Already a strong item, which makes it slightly better. Our precious blade mail nerfed, int reduced from eight, 10 to 8. Already a value item, so just reducing a little bit of that value. Not too upset there. Now, Pop-Tart, while Trent is doing this big-time research, I want to ask you about the item that has occupied a lot of my thought during my waking hours. Headdress. Have we finally mm. figured out a sweet spot where headdress is not the default for every goddamn support in the game, Recipe cost increased from 150 to 200 on top of all the other nerfs. No more stats. It's down to like 1.7 regen. Where's this item stand? I think it's in a good spot now because now you can't start it with headdress plus two tangos. You can only do like headdress plus one tango and like a mingo, or like one tango and a, mm. a clarity, I guess, if you're desperate. So I think it it feels better to like not start I, as that. You definitely still you got max heal. Buried it out. I will happily confirm. Okay. So Silver Edge has just been gutted. Now it, it doesn't do sticks. anything but break. Wang. Yeah. And put, double check. And put your Shadow Blade on a slightly shorter cooldown. It does have true right, strength. Chen 650. Chen 900. Yup. <laughs> He's healing. All right, gang. It's official. Purge was wrong. And Silver Edge is a piece of shit. That kind of sucks. How did they not even reduce the cost of the recipe or anything? It's like, a it's a lost item, dude. This no one I- knows what to do with it. Well, yeah, but it, that's what I mean. It wasn't good before, and now you just made it so much worse. Like, why? Just take it out of the game temporarily if you want to do that. I'm literally. I'm. Does it still? It just breaks. Is that it? And it does not pierce spell immunity. It doesn't do anything. The initial hit cannot miss. And it's also undispellable. I mean, that part's kind of cool. You can't, like, BKB it off. Yes, you can't BKB it off, but you can't hit them with it if they pop BKB first. That is true. So, I mean, yeah. I'm, <laughs> still yeah. See it. I'm pretty out. Who buys yeah, this on Silver Edge? Who buys I would, it? I would see Meepos buy it. I would see Hector on his <clears throat> King would still buy it. 
garbage on Meepo now. Especially since Scotty just got buffed. Scotty is the item on Meepo now. E-Blade, Scotty, Blink, Hex. That's your Meepo build, bud. Free MMR right there, Pop-Tart. All right, why don't you go play some Meepo and stream it for everybody there? Well, I, well, free now, MMR. I, I'm a strategist, you see. I, <laughs> I could be a Meepo coach, but I don't have the I finger dexterity. Co- I could coach the NFL. I could be a general manager for the Dallas Cowboys. No, no, I'm, I, I couldn't do any of that. By now. But I could backseat some slow bitch playing Meepo and tell them what they're fucking up. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, what else happened? Uh, they're still hitting these uh, these laning items. The headdress, the bassy. Yep. And on 50 gold, 25 gold. So that's 50 gold recipe costs increase for the soul ring as well. That's a good call, though, Pop Tart. These gold changes hurt a lot more than those little number tweaks because it screws up what you can start with early. So preventing you from oh, getting yes. that that extra branch or whatever is a indirectly it's it's almost like putting a minus one to all stats on headdress now. That's one way you could look at it. Does it even have stats? It doesn't even have stats anymore. No, <laughs> that's what I mean. Like it, the yeah. item gives you minus one because now you can't buy the branch that you oh, normally I see you. get. Yeah, you're actually right. <laughs> it's the meta it way to look though. at it. Uh, Vlad's nerfed, mech nerfed, pipe increase cost. So all of the five man death ball items. Yes. Taking a slap. Um, and Trent, as we were talking about, Alchemist, disproportionately strong compared to like the Naga Siren, thanks to all these gold changes. They have leveled out Greevil's Greed. They've tweaked the numbers a little bit to reduce them. The base gold goes down, and even the multiplier was adjusted. So now Alchemist is not just getting free money. This is the antithesis of what they did to Undying with the Poor Man's Shield, where Undying was just shittier than he should have been, and Alchemist was... Way better than he should have been. Are you aware of what his win percent dropped after this patch? Alchemist? Yeah. I'm going to guess 6%. It was it was 4.5. That's a big Ooh. drop for a single day. Woo. That's actually crazy. Dude. And, of course, he was on the rise over the week because of the, uh, the goal changes. But, damn, that hurts. What is he at right now? Uh, he dropped down to 50, 50 percent on the nose. 50, okay, fifty point one nine. Okay. Before that, he was fifty four point six. Six nine to be fair. So, so yeah, the big winners over yeah. the day, I believe. Uh, I mean, let me find my trends here. A lot of heroes just got little tweaks. The Bloodseeker got a very small thirst buff. Uh, gold from track just for the bounty hunter got a slight nerf. How about uh, Clinks though? Yeah, uh, searing, da- searing damage uh, from the arrows up ten all levels, and then the mana costs it also got increased. But just that that added damage, his win rate went up by dun da 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 six point three percent by far the highest gain, wow. more than double the next highest gain over this week. I mean that's just a straight buff though. The mana cost didn't raise disproportionately, so searing arrows at level one. Went from 20 damage to 30 damage and 6 mana to 9 mana. So it's just a 50% increase across the board. If you're a level 1 clinks trading with people, you're like, yeah, I'll take that all day. 50% more damage on Searing Arrows level 1? Yes, please. Win yeah, my lane, you say? 47% win rate to a 53.2. I think I was watching like a BSJ video, and he was like, normal spells is like a, almost a 1 to 1 ratio of mana to damage. And yes. this one's like 100 damage for 27 mana. It's like, that's kind of insane when you think about it. Yeah. yeah even, as, the... even as a support, like, this doesn't look that bad. No, that's like, a very good way to look way. at it. I, I think support clinks will definitely be showing up in pubs. 100%. It was already annoying. There were already people yeah. that spammed it. Huh. And this makes it really dumb. It's sort of like the position four weaver. You don't offer any control, but you trade so well with all the other supports that you, yeah. you can kind of just mow them down. I mean, on top of that, too, everyone just lost a bunch of their HP regen, and they have less regen because they're buying headdresses that yeah. are now nerfed, and they can't buy more tangos. Dude, Clinks, I bet Clinks is busted as a five right Shit, now. Shit, dude. I want to play some Clinks 4 now. That sounds <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, how about DP? Uh, five movement speed nerf, so she's down to 310 base. Uh, Exorcism uh, now scales in terms of the additional movement speed. And Exorcism costs more mana, 50 at all levels. So now 250 I, at level one. I liked her changes. I thought they were appropriate and not too over the top. I feel like she'll still be fine doing her normal role thing. She's probably just not like a first pick instant every single game. But they didn't like... I yeah. really, I'm really glad they kept the bonus movement speed on her ulti. 
because I do think that's an important part of making this hero good. If they're going to give that skill to Medusa, I like having it on de uh, Death Prophet as well. It feels like Ice Frog just hates support Death Prophet. That's where I feel like these changes really hurt. You know, like level one exorcism is way shittier now with the movement speed and mana changes and your base movement yeah. speed. It's sort of like the Lycan thing. It just slows that timing down a little bit, recalibrates it so she's not, oh my God, how did the support just cripple us in the top lane at eight minutes or whatever? I think you have, when you see numbers like this scale, you see, you see the same thing later on for Pugna too, where it's like all of a sudden all their abilities don't just have a flat, like it now scales with each point you print in. Mm -hmm. I think those are really good changes because you don't want to change, you don't want to nerf the hero too much. You just want to make it do what they do just a little bit later in the game. I think right. the hero will probably still be playable. So, Not a support. minor tweaks to DK. Uh, Drow gets an armor buff. Ember Spirit. This is a hero I expected to see some changes. He has been so strong, so versatile. Searing Chains cooldown increased slightly. Looks like two seconds uh, at most levels. Though, it looks like, is there a typo in there? It says it was 11, 10, 12, 8. I think that's not the way it went. So I th Wait, for who, sorry? For, for em Searing Chains? Ember Spirit Ember. Searing Chains. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it definitely did not go 11, 10, 12, 8. That level three series change is a real bitch, man. I tell you. You got to save two points to get over it. So it looks like it's <laughs> mostly a level four searing chains nerf where it jumped to eight seconds and now it's 10 seconds. How long does it latch on to someone for? I think that scales as well. And I think it level, there's a talent for it, right? Oh, three seconds max level. Yeah, three seconds. So it looks like now with Caudal, you don't get perma rooted anymore. Ah. That's probably the big change. Okay. So if you have a Coddle refreshing your cooldowns, you used to be able to perma root somebody? Yeah, it looks like it reduces cooldown by six seconds. And if you're rooted for three seconds, there's a small window to get out and out of the Coddle envelope, it looks like. Okay. Well, the other thing is still the sliding, too, is still super annoying with Coddle. Yeah. yeah so I, I was like... actually just testing another thing that I was told was shadow patched. Um,. But not listed, and that is that if you uh, this might have been a few days ago, but if you Yule someone as Void Spirit for some reason, you weren't able to activate your BKB before getting hit by the Aether Remnant. But that's been patched oh. for anyone wondering. Ooh. That's that, pretty big, actually. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty huge. Big. But it was it definitely seems like it was a bug because, like, if you get Yules into Chrono, you can BKB before you're Chronoed. So I don't see why you wouldn't be able to BKB for Aether Remnant. There's like a one-frame buffer there, at least supposed yeah, there, to be. Yeah, for some years. reason, it wasn't working that way, uh, but that's been patched now. So if you if you get used by Void Spirit, you guys can queue up your BKB now, and you'll be fine. Okay. Shift queue that be. Yeah. All good. Void Spirit, or uh, pardon me, uh, Phoenix. Fire Spirit tweaked slightly. Longer cooldown, no change to the damage, and only longer cooldown in the first couple levels. Uh, Supernova Scepter Upgrade no longer allows you to cast Sunray. It used to do that, like, cross X Sunray thing, and no one really used it anyway, to be honest. I think everyone kind of forgot it existed. Oh, Even in yeah. all the games we cast with the Phoenix, I don't remember seeing it once. <laughs> huh. I <laughs> actually forgot about negatives. that entirely. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've only seen it, like, once or twice, too. I think, because if I'm not mistaken, your sunray has to be re has to be off cooldown, so you have to have not sunrayed before egging, which would be an unusual team fight situation. Because usually you're like sunraying someone to try and save them, and then when another target gets gone on, that's when you like dive into your egg or whatever, you know. So, but now it's a talent level twenty talent yes. changed from plus one point two five seconds on supernova stun duration is now sunray during supernova. I don't get this change. Why does this matter at all? Uh, because it's a cool aspect of the hero, and now it's not locked behind Aghanims. Yeah, I see it the same way as I like, happened to Coddle. So yeah, it's like... a buff? Eh. I... And why was this hero buffed? That's the part I guess I don't understand. You would get Ags probably on the same time you get level 20, right? Yeah, I would guess maybe a little earlier because you're a support. So like, Because most people just rush it like first item, and maybe you're not getting the best levels. Okay. I, yeah, I wouldn't look at so much as a buff or a nerf. It's just a, a change. I'm not sure which way's better, to be, to be honest with you. Yeah. She definitely got nerfed pretty hard in the laning stage, though, because her whole thing is fire spirits and oppression, and now that's being reduced by a lot. Like, six seconds longer on every level. Uh, well, not they every level, but those early levels kind of hurts. 
they nerfed the damage too a few patches ago also so they yeah. got hit again hmm. but I, I think just having a hero where it's like you don't need an agonims to play the hero is a good thing you saw the same thing they changed with coddle a way back when yeah where, like, you had to get ags on that hero to make it playable yeah they're just, they're just opening up the hero to more branches to play which i like so you're talking about the support Pugna. It feels like his changes, as you mentioned, Pop-Tart, really hurt the su potential support Pugna where you're lower level. Um, yes. All of his level fours are exactly the same, but Decrep now scales, so the cast range kind of dinky at level one. And Nether Ward also scales in duration so that it's only 18 seconds now as opposed to the fixed 30 that it was previously. That... I, that hurts. I think it has to be this way because the way that he was set before, the support one was actually like way better than Core Pugna, I think. Yeah. And that's, I don't think Core Pugna's, era, I don't think support Pugna's dead from these changes. I just think it's not insanely broken. I think it's still going to be good in games versus like where it hard counters enemy heroes like Legions or something. Okay. I think it would be a good strategy pick to put in there. Yeah, I think the ulti is still super busted for the way. Like, as long as we're still playing this, like, kind of snowballing meta, I feel like the ultimate's still going to be super good for keeping your cores on the map. Mm -hmm. Yep. The way you can, like, decrypt, save a teammate, heal, save another teammate, and then by the time you're decrypt, like, the way your spells rotate it, see, it feels, it looks real good to play this hero just because everything kind of lines up nicely. And everyone wants to dive you, and you have a save. Like, if you have yeah. a, if you're just alting someone, not only are you covered by your own nether ward, but if they try and dive you, like, a TA or something, you can just decrep her or yourself. And you're mm -hmm. like, haha. <laughs> like, supports are supposed to be, like, the first target in a team fight. And having a, na a natural save like that is very annoying for a lot of cores. Mm -hmm. So the last... Our boy Razor took a beating for some reason. I was going <laughs> to say, that was the last one with really significant changes. His base movement speed is now down to 280. Down from 285, and the Storm Surge ally movement speed reduced at one by one percent at all levels. I mean, he's still just a counter pick hero. I don't think this. I mean, his laning just got a little bit worse with the five movement speed loss, but I don't. I don't think it's gonna matter. Yeah, I think he'll still do his job. It looks real sad to see two percent though. I just look at that spell and I don't even want to level it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that first level is just. Ugh. Why did I lost his sprint speed for some reason to hero that doesn't seem that broken anyway? Maybe because it's just percent based and now there's so much more flat that they have to tweak down all the percents. That's probably really what these are. That is exactly what I was going to say, yeah. And that same thing with Spirit Breaker. Like, sure, he lost 2%, but in reality, this is probably just equivalent to... In fact, it is equivalent to what you're losing on, like, treads and stuff. So it's it's actually fine. You know, maybe, yeah. this, maybe the Razor one feels worse than it is for that exact same reason, now that I'm thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, it's probably but... completely, like, a nothing. Let's see. Did his win rate go up or down? You've got to reduce the percentages on his movement speed and stuff. Oh, uh, he lost one percent. He win scales rate. stupidly. <laughs> That's not that bad, though. I mean, one percent. It's a slight Every... over over adjustment, I guess. Lighter lost point one percent win rate. Oh my god, he's dead. All right, Jeez. so the winner of uh, well, I don't know. Okay, what what do you guys think is the most useless change in this patch? useless well like what is the the uh, ranking OD. of all these changes which one is the most like well that doesn't fucking matter at all i i'm, I'm going out and saying od i don't oh, think I, I do like that one um i kind of want to pick uh, no it's definitely bloodlust from the 8 10 12 14 percent his win rate went up that's got to be the most useless one i was gonna say the <laughs> The lone druid level 25 talent reduced from 0.25 <laughs> spirit bear attack base attack time to 0 0.2. Wasn't it 0.2 before? Am I crazy? I have no idea, but that's just pretty sure it was. It's like a combination of we're not seeing lone druid. It's a level 25 talent. It's it, yeah, it's like a 20% change or whatever, but still it just seems so I don't What is that? Uh, actually it was uh, 0. 0.5. Level 25 right talent, right, right talent was reduced spirit bear base attack time reduction from 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.25, and now it's 0. 0.25 to 0. 0.2. So it's actually just been buffed and buffed. There we go. <laughs> I had no idea. Is that the I'm sure we're you? really going to feel that 0. 0.05 oh, hey, base wait. attack time change. I wasn't crazy. All right, it's 7.20E, his level 20 left talent. Uh... Increased spirit ba bear base attack time. It used to be from 0.2. Wait, attack time reduction from 0.2 to 0.3. Oh my god, this is so confusing. 
Yeah, because base attack time yeah. is one of those inverted things too. So it's reducing. So it used to be point two, and now it's point two on twenty five. It used to be point two on twenty. Ooh. Okay. Well, there you go. All right. And he's had a lot of talent changes. He sure has. Lone Druid's been all over the place, man. <laughs> oh yeah, from like the ranged Lone Druid. Yeah, he really has been everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm looking for the buff patch because I'm sure there will be a B patch with a lot of buffs. These were all nerfs, right? No one got buffed. Um, not super significant. No. Oh wait, OD did. got buffed. Sorry, I forgot about that. Yeah. And Drow get the base damage, uh, the base armor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ch and Clink's got the buff. So there were like five or six buffs. Everyone else got nerfed. Brewmaster buff. Yeah. Chaos Knight, the uh, ulti is now mm -hmm. a static uh, 125 second cooldown. Used to be 145 at level one. So some very minor buffs. This was uh, all right. We're tuning everything down a little bit. We got too crazy. Let's bring it on back and uh, see how the dust settles. I'm I'm pretty okay with this patch. When did this come out, by the way? How how long has it been? This Day patch? Two? Yeah. A. Yesterday? Last night, I think? Like 24 hours? That sound right? Yeah, I want to say. Okay, it came out on the 21st at some point. So, yeah, uh... we, we don't have too much data. Need to play some games, get a feel for some of these changes. Need to see support clinks in action. I wonder, I'm going to look at the pro page, or the front page right now. Let's see. Are there any support clinks is being played in pubs? <laughs> no clinks there. No clinks there. Oh, guys, this is your chance. You can go be hot, fresh, and cool. I don't see any clinks on the front page of Dota TV. <laughs> well, you know what you must do. Report back to us in our reviews about your position five clinks experience and how you won yes. free MMR for free. five stars. I need some more of that Pop-Tart like in MMR in my life, man. <laughs> I don't think Lycan's nearly as threatening as he was four weeks was, ago or whatever it, it was. It was real fun when we were doing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're uh, getting towards the close here. Pop-Tart, um, what, what was your biggest takeaway from this event, this epic grind that was ESL <sighs> Los Angeles online? What was the big lesson? Um, I want to say that the people you see on camera that they're all genuine you know they all love the game and it was it, it's weird to go from like a year and a half ago i was a fan who was watching all these people on stream and like oh my god like this is so cool to just watch them put on the show and now to put on a show and to see all these people talk about their passion day in and day out for 23 days like you, you just go to appreciate everybody who works in the dota scene because it's a it's a long grind and everyone loves the game dude you're like the only other person that has this this feeling that i do because i was the exact same way <laughs> i was a complete because everyone else is so old in the scene like they've been in the scene like forever that they didn't really mm -hmm. have a time where they were just a fan you know what i mean mm -hmm. at least that's what it felt like for me yeah. like i don't think there's many people that have come in after me there's like tsunami i guess but you play dota one no i didn't play dota one yeah i didn't play dota one i didn't even watch dota before the ti3 grand finals like yeah, ti3 me, grand finals yeah, is like watched, what i got into yeah ti for me that was my first ti was ti3 was watching that so there you go so follow-up question pop tart how much did your training at midas mode 2 prepare you for this grind i would say that i use camera grip a lot and after midas mode 2 like your finger when you're like holding down the middle mouse button to drag the camera around my finger would hurt and going through like ESL now, like I'm, I'm pretty much a pro. My fingers are callous to hold down mouse grip for the whole. <laughs> are you whole, gonna start bouldering or something now? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like I don't, I use like JJ's old settings and I've never customized them. But after this event, I kind of want to go through and see how much of the settings I can mess with, just because my finger holding down this mouse wheel to grip and do camera is, it's, a, it's a little painful. After I remember he hours. set it to a key. He set it to like left control or something at some point. Yeah, he has um he toggles it on and off and I never use toggle. But right. I think I'm going to have to add this into my repertoire, you know, slowly <laughs> merge my settings into more and more like JJ's. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, someone said we didn't even ask you what your favorite pop tart is. That's a great question. Ooh. Thank you, power was taken. Wars. But you oh. have to freeze the pop tarts, okay? Damn. I know, I know. It's wild. Yes. Do not toast your pop tarts. Freeze yes. them way better. Trust They're me. so much better frozen. Thank yes. you. Oh, thank I'm so oh, glad you know this. Believes no this. one else knows this, I feel like. <laughs> yep. It's a They're secret. They're like 10 times better. They're so good. It's huh. it's weird, but yeah, I haven't had like a toasted Pop-Tart, I want to say, in like over 10 years. But like a frozen Pop-Tart or just like a normal Pop-Tart, oh, delicious. So good. So um, I forgot we did get a good audience question that somebody actually DM'd me on Discord. You guys ready for this? 
Ready. All right. From Greaves, what have we learned from ESL Online? Does reverting back to regional leagues show that Tier 1 teams are far more superior than the rest if they play seriously, or does it show that Tier 2 teams can be quite competitive as well? Are imports, mm. i.e. players from other regions, going to be a difference maker for Tier 1 teams? All right. I have a, a little bit of a hot take, I guess. You know that old Batman quote with Bane where he's like, I was born in the darkness and all that? Yeah. For me, this is what I think Tier 2 teams are. Like, what they're really good at. Like, everyone's surprised that Viking GG and Chicken Fighters did so well. But these Tier 2 teams have, like, grown up and, like, exploded based off online events. Like, this is their home ground and turf. And you have, like, the Tier 1 teams coming in with stand-ins. And, like, they may be a little bit less focused. And then the Tier 2 teams are just like, nah, this is this is our zone. We're, this is how we play the game now. So I feel like it's a good contrast to have the Tier 2 teams kind of wake up the Tier 1 teams saying, no, you have to focus again. Like, we're going to hear, and this is... We're going to stomp you guys if you relax a little bit. It definitely shows that the gap is maybe not as... Because we, we perceive there to be an absolutely humongous gap because mm -hmm. we never get to see them play Tier 2. Like, the entirety of last year, really. Uh, there'd be some qualifiers. Like, even though Secret's, like, forced to play in these qualifiers. Uh, and they, they did definitely destroy, let's be honest, in a lot of those qualifiers. So, I guess we... I can't say we didn't see them play, like, Tier 2 at all. But we did have upsets over the past couple of years from online. And now... We should be seeing more of these matchups, and uh, I I don't know. It's uh, I'm sure it's a lot harder for a tier one team to take online seriously. Uh, is exactly what I wanted to bring up. How do you gauge, especially with the stand-in factor? You know, coaches playing for teams. I think any match where you've got a coach playing for one of the professional players, they're by default not taking it 10 out of 10 serious. Not that they're trying to lose. They always still want to win. There's always competitive integrity. But there's just that feeling of, well, we're playing with our coach, man. I mean, come on. Let's, let's, let's have a little fun with it. Let's, this is definitely more of a scrim than an official. I look forward to the, uh, the super official hardcore cash money tournaments online. Yeah. What was the prize pool of ESL one online? I, which is kind of interesting. I always think about prize pool and think of live events. The online prize pool was pretty good, right? It was sixty k for VP. Mm -hmm. Not bad. Yeah, viewership's been fine. Um, I don't know. I, to me, it's more about the finances. Of what really holds tier two teams back is the background stress of not having any income, because very few tier two players are on a team that pays them a significant salary. And a lot of them are on like ragtag kind of player orgs and you only get paid if you win. And a lot of the tier two teams are like struggling in qualifiers when tier one teams are fighting in there. And it's really hard to play your best Dota and be completely focused on the game and get the most out of practice when there's this voice in the back of your head that's like, all right, I got six months before mom kicks me out. Okay, I've got $1,000 left in the bank account. Like all that background yeah. stress is not something that tier one players have to really think about. That's part of the value of an org like EG is they take away all that stress. They have somebody cook for you. They have somebody show you how to work out. All you have to do is worry about being a, a basic person and focusing on Dota. So that's the big gap for me. And I think the more we can create resources for tier two teams to close that gap, the more we'll see it be more about skill, not, hey, who's got the better computer? That seems to be an issue in South America still. <laughs> yeah, poor Beast goes. Apparently, they're dropping out of all leagues that aren't SA because the connection is just too bad. Oh, that's a bummer. Just can't be done. It sucks, dude. Oh. Fucking sucks. Yeah. Bring back land. Long. Let's uh, let's hope that the world starts healing as, as fast as possible. Do your part. Wash your hands. Stay the blazes home. <laughs> as, as the Nova Scotian saying goes now, I guess. Stay the blazes home. That's what our premier said, and everyone memed the shit out of them. <laughs> boy. It was pretty funny. <laughs> oh, God. That's perfect. All right. Pop-Tart, you got anything else for us? Any closing words? Anything grinding your gears? Anything chapping your ass that you want to get out there? Um, No, not really. Thanks for having me. It was a blast. My first podcast. Wow. Wow. That's great. We're going to have to send you over to position six at some point and to, uh, uh, to our own friends at the, you know, the side pool. I'm sure Cap will, you know, you got to hang out with Cap. Yeah. I'm sure he'd love to have you. Yeah, you and Cap can talk about uh, all that overtime you guys got paid for at uh, ESL Los Angeles. And Catan. And I don't Catan. know how much I'm allowed to say about overtime. Lots of Catan. <laughs> Catan. Shade. What's wrong with you? 
He's Antic still fun game. See, poor Pop Tart is still in that like honeymoon phase where he doesn't know who he can say negative things about. Like it's hard to know that balance. So you got to play. Yeah, let it him safe go. Always. Don't don't corrupt the poor boy. All right. Yeah, All right. I don't I don't know what I want to say or yeah, what don't I can say. Ship say. Up there. Shut your mouth. I want to say <laughs> thank you for everyone who had me everywhere because. You make you make my dream possible. So that's all. Oh, that, that's nice. There we go. Hearts in chat. There but very go. true. Very true. Well, thank you so much, Pop Tart. It's a pleasure. Uh, we enjoy chatting with you, and hopefully, you find some more gigs. It's been tough for observers, and uh, I hope there's enough work that your deep dive into the industry is worth it, man. And I think we're on a good path for that. So very exciting times. Thank you. Thank Thanks, Pop Tart. All right. Well, then, um, I don't know what we're going to talk about next week. I guess we got more tournaments on. We Play is happening now. Dota Pit just announced that they're going to be doing an online league. So while the COVID crisis continues, uncertainty all around, but we've still got plenty of online Dota to keep us entertained. Oh, you guys should watch Navi versus Baited. Oh, and We Play because I'll be casting it. When's and that on? Tomorrow morning? Nah, two days, I think. I think two it's days. On Friday. Ooh. And, uh, or, no, it's on Saturday. It's on Saturday. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, go watch we play. Watch it. Watch it. Cheer for bait. <laughs> We're gonna do it. All right, that's it. We'll get this up. You guys know where to find it. iTunes, Spotify, and then on YouTube later. Thank you so much for watching, folks. We will catch you next time. Enjoy yourselves. Bye bye.